Ukrainians and look into forces shaping the Ukrainian identity. We'll also tell you about two Ukrainian hostages freed from Russia this week and finally look at a pro-freedom protest in Rostov. And uh, we, as always, encourage you to download our program on the Mixed Cloud so you can listen to all the best interviews. Uh, to watch our best reports, you can do that on our YouTube page. And please go out to our web page, en.hromatske.ua. The Euro 2016 soccer tournament has again been marred by soccer violence among fans, notably with Russian fans fighting English fans in Marseille last week. So uh, there were a lot of information. There were 43 fans from Russia detained. 20 of them had been deported from France. Uh, according to the BBC, there were participants uh, from other nas nationalities which had been arrested. They were from uh, Russia, in England and France. Uh, but the Guardian piece uh, had uh, drawn a lot of uh, media attention. It says about possible Kremlin ties to the soccer fan organization. Uh, it quoted source uh, in the White Hall in the British uh, government who said that these links are possible. Uh, why they are there? Uh, because uh, we use information that some of the football fans uh, were connected to different organizations. Uh, and um, in order to know more, and in order to know more before the tomorrow's game between Russia and Wales, we are calling to Marseille where there is a Russian journalist, the reporter from uh, Novaya Gazeta, uh, Raman Anin. Uh, he had been uh, also during the very intense uh, fights. He was, he's been writing uh, great pieces during that time. Uh, Raman, thanks a lot for being with us. Let us know. Tomorrow, uh, Russia will play with Wales. Uh, so, um, you know, you're in Marseille, but still, are there any talks about some intense security is situation? Uh, you know, what is the police doing? What is the atmosphere? Well, actually, I'm not in Marseille now. I'm in Moscow. I had to come back. But yes, I was in Marseille and in Lille during those intense fights between uh, Russian and English supporters and English supporters and police. So, uh, actually, the expectations about tomorrow game is are not very good uh, since we are playing, Russia is playing Wales, and uh, English and Wales fans united uh, against Russian fans. And, uh, I mean, uh, there might be some problems in uh, Toulouse. Uh, so, the game will be in Toulouse tomorrow. There might be some problems. Um, yep. And, uh, and uh, Roman, you've seen this, uh, probably you read there are these articles, and there are different speculations about some ties to the Kremlin, about how organized were these fans. Uh, from what you've experienced, uh, you know, there is something you could observe as a reporter, and from something you research, research later, uh, how legitimate are, le legitimate are those talks? Well, in my point of view, this is just paranoia. Uh, because, to be honest, you know, the fights in Marseille started, uh, they were started by English fans. Uh, I mean, the first fight, which was on the 9th, this was the fight between the English fans and the police, and there were no any Russian supporters. Then the second fight, which was uh, the biggest fight in the tournament, uh, Russian supporters uh, participated in the fight, and uh, but, I mean, simultaneously, uh, I think that, you know, English supporters are at this stage the biggest problem for the Russian authorities, because there are more of them. Yes, of course, I mean, every, you know, fan uh, which uh, takes part in a fight is guilty and it's bad and so on. Uh, but I would say that on this stage, what I've seen in Marcel, in Lille, uh, in Lille there were, were fights just between the English supporters and the police. I didn't see any fights between English supporters and Russian supporters. And as for ties to Kremlin, I mean, in my point of view, this is paranoia. The fact is that, uh, yes, Russian fans, I mean, Russian hooligans, uh, are better organized. So English hooligans are kind of old school hooligans, you know, they are not trained well, they are not uh, greatest fighters, let us say. There are many of, uh, I, mean, I mean, in England there are many experienced hooligans, but the thing is that they are more controlled by the state. Uh, Russian hooligans are not as much controlled, so they still can leave the country, they still are allowed to go to different uh, tournaments. And that is why, uh, you know, 
people think that okay if they are so organized it means that you know the state is behind them but i don't believe in this and uh, in my point of view what was happening in uh, france and what is happening in france uh, is not a kind of uh, state hybrid war it just you know these are just the fights between the fans you mentioned paranoia, but why do you think there's paranoia and why there's so much attention, namely to Russian fans, whereas we know that people from other countries were engaged in football violence? It's because Russia has not the best image in the world, and uh, that is why people uh, pay more attention to Russia than to other nations. Uh, I think that's the only reason. And, uh, of course, I mean, uh, the fact that Russia has such image is just the problem of Russia, but uh, here, I mean, I saw all those fights, and uh, English supporters create much more problems to the police and to the authorities than Russian supporters. Uh, but just because of the, Russian, of the image of Russia, everybody pays attention only to Russian fans. Uh, but, uh, Roman, um, another thing which uh, foreign press, not just press, is following is the reaction of the authorities. So uh, what was in the news that Vladimir Putin laughed off uh, fan violence and terror and urged local authorities in France to treat supporters from all countries equally? Uh, we are interested how the whole thing is seen in Moscow, in, in Russia, especially how the people who are coming back treated, what the officials are uh, indeed saying about the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, probably the biggest problem, actually. And Russian authorities, when they support this kind of uh, violence, I mean, uh, they do support, you know, uh, when you read the statements of the members of parliament or even, yeah, Vladimir Putin, uh, it creates such rumors, okay, if the state, you know, supports them, then uh, the state is probably behind them. I think that such reaction is stupid. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, each authority, each, each, each uh, person who is in power should, uh, should not back up these people, should not support, you know, the violence, should not support what is happening there. Uh, and, uh, I mean, if you see on the reaction of, uh, you know, other politicians in other countries, uh, I don't remember if any of them, you know, supported the fans which are creating uh, chaos in uh, France, and Russia, Russian authorities were the only one. So, uh, I mean, I feel a bit ashamed, you know, uh, by the fact that, okay, the things are going on there are bad, but you support them. Um, and, uh, you know, that is why Russian authorities should not be offended when somebody thinks that, you know, uh, it's a kind of state policy. If you support it, then people will think that it's a state policy. Thanks a lot, uh, Roman. It was indeed very interesting. It was Roman Anin, a uh, correspondent from Novaya Gazeta, independent Russian newspaper, who had been covering the uh, football championship and uh, also the rights and the fight in France. And we'll be back in a few seconds. Ukrainians' long-cherished hopes for visa-free travel to the European Union have again been put on hold among European fears of possible mass immigration. Or maybe there are some other reasons. Let's talk about this. Uh, because this week, European Union states held off agreeing to ease travel rules for Georgia on Wednesday, and Turkey, Ukraine and Kosovo also should expect more delays in visa waiving as the bloc turns more cautious and amid immigration fears. So uh, that was a, a source from the EU delegation, and Reuters reported that at the beginning of uh, months that visa-free travel to the EU was likely to put on hold. We have here in our studio Volodymyr Yermolenko, who is a a journalist, but he is also an expert on uh, our relations with the European Union and is covering and following this topic. So, Volodya, what is the current state of affairs? The current state of affairs is that Ukraine fulfilled so-called the Visa Liberalization Action Plan, which is, was a very long way because Yanukovych has received it in 2010. So Ukraine received it under Yanukovych. And Ukraine was fulfilling it for six years. So it was the longest period among all the states which, which had this plan. Finally, we got, we got it. The European Commission said it was OK and even made a legislative proposal. So it was kind of a, the, the mark that everything is fine and the decision should be taken by EU Council and European Parliament. And at this stage, we had this, we had this interesting, I would say, innovation by the EU saying that, look, some EU member states are saying, look, we have to 
uh, we have to have first a mechanism which would stop, e eventually uh, stop the visa-free regime for those countries which violate it. Now, there is a number of questions which we can raise. For example, why can we proceed with visa-free regime? But this visa stoppage mechanism, uh, for example, can be implemented at the same time. Why should we wait for it? So, number of questions, and it's interesting how it will develop. Vladimir, you've been following the topic for quite some time. Honestly, have you ever believed that Ukraine will get the visa free regime? Yes, frankly, I believe that because, I mean, uh, there, was, uh, there was an attempt of the EU, you know, to make this process technical. And uh, it was made technical, there was a set of uh, conditions, and Moldova had a, a similar set of conditions, it received it. Serbia had a similar set of conditions, and it received it back in 2009. And if you, if you look at the uh, migration problems, migration pressure, well, you have the Western Balkans, which are much more pressing in this term, the EU. So the number of illegal migrants which coming from the, uh, to the EU uh, f f through the Western Balkans is like hundreds of thousands of people but compared, they do not to, compared to, I don't know, maybe hundreds of people from the eastern border. But they do not border on Russia. Yes, but I mean, the, the issue is, I mean, the, the clear issue is how the EU is thinking of protecting itself against illegal migration. And here, the problem, the key problem is not so much Ukraine, but I would say the southern Mediterranean and western Balkans. Uh, but what, what we know that um, the Ukrainian internally displaced, which we have in Ukraine around 2 million, and uh, there are some in Russia and Belarus, mainly they almost don't go uh, to the European Union. And I'd like you bring, um, to bring the, uh, the graph which shows the level, um, the way how visa are refused. And if you look at this uh, graph, then uh, you see that there is a very, very little, um, you know, data. So you have, for instance, just 3.4% of people who apply for visas and who are refused. But Volodya, can you elaborate more on that? Is it just because there are not many people applying? Or they are not, uh, because it it's really looks like it's very easy to get this visa. Well, the issue with the uh, visa refusals is much more complex one because you, you can have, for example, um, a delay in reply, or you have you have you, you, you can say that you, you you are not really formally refusing visa, but you are saying you are not accepting these documents be because the package is not full, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, this number of refusal doesn't really reveal it. But frankly, also, I mean, in Ukraine, it's also probably an exaggeration to the way how the EU is refusing the visas. Really, the situation is. Not not bad and it's, 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 it's improving. What you say about the internal displaced persons is very interesting because indeed this, this, well, this humanitarian disaster which we had um, uh, linked with this war in eastern Ukraine did not uh, turn, did not translate itself into a wave of migrants to the EU. And the question is why? I think one of the answers is that Ukraine as a country is safe. It's, it's, it's only have like uh, one, one little segment of its territory covered by war, and basically, basically people don't even, majority of people stay in the surround areas, like in eastern Ukraine or southern Ukraine. They even don't go to uh, western Ukraine, not even uh, to the EU, for example. And, but many uh, go to Russia. Many go to Russia, but still the majority are staying inside Ukraine. Where there is no visa regime on the border, and we may presume that if there were a visa-free regime, on the western border then many people would go to the west. Yes, but we should remember that visa-free regime covers, I mean, only the short stays and uh, the short stays, the short-term stays, which is like ten, uh, 90 days per half a year. So it's, it's not really the way that, you know, you, you, you wave the, you, you, um, you lift the visa and then everybody will go and stay. Now you have, you still have uh, lots of instruments to control it. And now if you look at the statistics, for example, of organized crime, you see that Ukrainians don't really, uh, don't really, are not really present anywhere. Like in Italy, they are not present in the, in the ethnic groups which are the most criminal gen. In Germany, they don't really are in the top 10 or top, top 15 groups. Uh, so they are, they are not really posing a criminal threat to the EU. And, uh, Volodya, if you, you, some people would say there are different reasons for that, you know, corruption, there, are some, uh, there is some procedure. So what are still the obstacles from the Ukrainian side? 
Well, uh, frankly speaking, like if you take this visa, uh, visa uh, liberalization action plan, it was also a green light for, 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 from the EU side, but uh, everybody understands that Ukraine does not really, I mean, fulfill everything because we still, there, we ha we still have a national anti-corruption um, prevention ag agency which is not in force, and it's one of the, one of the reasons, but uh, one of the criteria. But still, uh, we have all the key criteria fulfilled. We have, for example, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau uh, is established and it's opening its anti-corruption, I think it's over 100 of cases already opened and it's one of the, one of the thing which was important for the EU to have anti-corruption institutions work. What is the danger here right now is that, you know, uh, there, there, there can be politicians in Ukraine who will speculate on that and say, look, the EU is not giving a visa free regime, therefore let's refuse from our obligations. Let's, let's refuse from some anti-corruption, you know, uh, progress. Uh, let's, let's have some amendments to some, you know, laws on, uh, on uh, special confiscation, whatever. And, and this, is the, uh, this is the key danger. When, when you're delaying this process, there will be more and more Eurosceptic uh, tensions inside Ukraine. And I would, I would stress simply one point, is that in, today in the EU integration of Ukraine, frankly speaking, if we take the whole picture, the visa-free visa regime was the, the most promising one. Because if you take, for example, free trade area, it's not really properly working. Well, it's working legally, but U Ukraine's trade with the EU is still falling, not, not to say Ukraine's trade with Russia. And the, the, the benefits, the key benefits will be expected, I think, in some three or five years, whereas visa-free regime is something that Ukrainian society is really expecting for. For no particular reason. If we don't want to go there, then what do we need this visa-free regime for? No, why? I mean, uh, there is over a million of people who are, who are getting Schengen visas from Ukraine. So it's a huge, huge amount of people. And they are, again, they are not uh, enriching this, uh, you know, the, the number of illegal migrants. They are by, the, by the way, what you have said about the criminal element and uh, the absence of Ukrainians from the statistic may be due to the fact that not all the criminals associate themselves or identify themselves with Ukraine or Ukrainians. And this is a topic of our next part of the program. Oh, well, uh, we should um, say that the visa issue also had come up amid the St. Petersburg uh, Economic Forum and moved to, uh, which moved to some ties, a different kind of, I won't say warm ties between the EU and Russia and the European Commissioner President Jean-Claude Juncker. Uh, said the following uh, about the EU-Russia cooperation, and I'll, we'll ask about that. And in spite of our differences, the European Union works with Russia to tackle a number of global issues and regional conflicts, ranging from the fight against terrorism to the nuclear program in Iran and the conflict in Syria. So what we know from the people we talk in St. Petersburg who worked during this forum that there was a clear you know, willingness from the both sides, from the EU and Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, to kind of take away the sanctions. You know, there was this uh, the thing, uh, it's not directly com connected to uh, the visa issue, but still, uh, Volodya, would you say what it should mean, what we should expect? Well, I think we are, we, are, we, are, we are witnessing an increasing pressure on sanctions inside the EU, and this forum was not the only, the only thing. I think, I think the key process is what is happening inside the German government. If we look at German government, we see that uh, Foreign Minister Steinmeier is more and more pressing for kind of a diverging itself from the Merkel's policy, from the policy of Chancellor. And we see different interpretations. What are the uh, criteria for lifting sanctions? For example, uh, initially the, the status quo was that uh, you will lift sanctions only after full implementation of Minsk agreements. And full implementation of Minsk agreements means uh, you have the election there, you have the control of the border, you have the removal of troops, etc., etc. Now there is increasing talk about the formula substantial implementation of Minsk agreements. And this is what, what Steinmeier said. And it's, you, can, you can guess what this substantial means, uh, but uh, I, think, I think it's, 
it's it's kind of a very bad sign. I'm not really expecting that the sanctions will be will be on danger this time because the EU is going to vote for it. I think in the end of Ju June because they are they are valid until July. But uh, probably in the next uh, six months, by the end of the year, we, ha we can expect everything. Volodymyr Yermolenko, Romanian journalist who has again proven that he's a real expert on European affairs, and will be back in this studio in a few seconds. While we're talking to a lot of journalists and researchers who are coming to Ukraine these days, some of them are really researching on the Ukrainian identity and explore that it's happening exactly right now, that it's now when we kind of create in the political nation, it's not just a national or ethnic uh, identity. So what was uh, interesting that um, recently the Ukrainian Razumkov Center, Center, it's a famous Kyiv-based think tank, released one stage of a long-term study into Ukrainian identity and political attitudes. It was like more than 100 pages. So we look at that. There were some very recent things connected to the attitude towards Russia, uh, the war in the East, uh, to the people who fought in the war, NATO and everything else. So we would like to present... And to the very notion of homeland for Ukrainians. Yeah, so uh, while, uh, before go while going to there, so we are showing you some graph and... Uh, Basically, we would discuss it. So uh, what do you identify yourself with the most? So that was a very uh, interesting uh, first, maybe basic graphic. And you see that the people, 40%, uh, they identify themselves with the country, uh, then as much with the city. And uh, I would put atten draw attention to that, how little people are still relate themselves to Soviet Union, Europe, and Russia. So that would be the, 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 something to know. And um, if you look at the, do you see Ukraine as your homeland? So at that graph, we have 93% of the, um, those who were um, questioned to, to, to tell that. And uh, for instance, if we go later, um, there was a question, if you could choose where would you want to live, so majority, still 60%. I don't know, what do you think about that? They think that they uh, want to stay in Ukraine. 20% would be happy to live in New York, but it's very theoretical. And yeah, 4.5 in Russia. I think that in every case, we should keep in mind that those questions are not, uh, I would say, ideally formulated. Because, for instance, some people who say, we want to live in Ukraine, still think of Ukraine as part of Russia. Uh, let's see, but it's also uh, the another question for speculation is the language. So there was also that question asked. Uh, there we see the growth because there are polls done in 2008 and 2015. So almost 60% of the Ukrainians say their mother tongue is Ukrainian, 22%. Uh, speak both Russian and Ukrainian, and uh, 15... Again, 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 the preciseness of formulations. They do not speak both Russian and Ukrainian. They say both Ukrainian and Russian, or both Russian and Ukrainian are their native tongues, or their mother tongues. For me, the question about native tongue is senseless, or almost senseless, because, for instance, my native tongue, my mother tongue, is Russian. 80% of my speech to na uh, today is in Ukrainian with some 10% in English, which leaves only 10% for the Russian language in my communication. But I will never say that Russian is not my mother tongue. So what's the purpose of knowing who considers which language their mother tongue if we do not know the but as you know, Andrei, we looked through the uh, details of the research and saw that there is a difference between the social use, which still a very, you know, complicated and interesting question. Complicated mm. doesn't mean a difficult one. By the way, by the way, I remember Soviet statistics where 75 or no, even more than 80 percent of Ukrainians said that Ukrainian is their mother tongue, which was more than, for instance, in Belarus, where only 75 percent said that uh, Belarusian is their mother tongue. But you maybe don't remember. I remember the Soviet times very well. And I remember that with 89 percent of Ukrainians proclaiming their mother tongue Ukrainian, probably half of them only spoke Ukrainian. 
So that was an interesting thing, and we do have the questions uh, also. Um, I don't want to make it in a kind of a proper order uh, that we also, during our interview, had the more general um, oversight. Uh, so the, the graph we would like also to bring is the general opinion on the conflict uh, in Ukraine. And uh, um, so there we see that we have the... Um, what is that? So, uh, which was surprising that besides half of the people, half of the population said it's a Russian aggression. Uh, Twenty believe that this is a fight between Russia and the U.S. for the areas of influence on the Ukrainian territory. For me, uh, somebody is, is absolutely surprising because it's really coherent to the what the Russian TV channels say. Well, this only shows that banning Russian channels from Ukrainian air does not solve the problem, and many people still tend to watch it. And the recent poll also on coexistence of Ukraine and the occupied territories says that 45% uh, of the population uh, thinks that the termination of any relationship between Ukraine and occupied territories uh, could be possible. Uh, 23 think that Donbas should get the special status with the opportunity to influence Ukrainian politics and pretty many things it's, it's really hard uh, to answer. Uh, but for me to read the whole, like the whole research, it was very interesting that this public opinion, you know, it's, it's still, you, you see the Ukrainian society is more willing to really, you know, to give it a special status uh, to the territories. It's in a way more moderate than what you see in the big media, at least in what you see in the kind of mainstream media or what you hear in the Ukrainian parliament. For me, 45 percent, or how many, 45 percent, yes, who want to terminate all the relations with the occupied territories is a very, very disturbing sign. This means that those people have uh, more or less reconciled themselves with the uh, supposition that those areas won't be returned to Ukraine. Which is probably also should be discussed. What is the result? Because you know, like, what is the result of the poll? So um, the the other thing we like to see that the, the question we should ask, would you want your region leave the Ukrainian state and create an independent state? And in that case, we do have 88%, um, uh, almost 89% of people who say no. 2% said yes, but which is uh, uh, because we don't have the reasons to, 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 to challenge because the, the Razumkov Center for their findings, because we know that them for, for ages as a trusted organization. Um, so the last from, from us uh, was a question on the referendum for the European Union. So 56% would vote yes, 17 vote against, and um, as much as 11 wouldn't take part in voting. So uh, there is a lot more in, in, in this uh, story, and the, um, our colleague, Josh Kovensky, has talked to an expert who was working with this poll and who explained uh, a bit more. We have the Ukrainians now uh, uh, thinking uh, themselves more than citizens of Ukraine than of the regions. So all national identity prevail our regional. Uh, but two, uh, 10 years before we have a situation vice versa. Mm -hmm. So regional uh, identities prevail uh, on uh, all national. Right. It means that uh, people uh, more associate themselves with this country with Ukraine, so, not with the region. And what does Ukraine mean to them? Is it more speaking the Ukrainian language or is there more of like a kind of civic definition? Uh, it's, it's very interesting, very interesting okay. observation. Uh, because normally we are speaking about Ukrainians as a civic or political nation or just belongingness or citizenship that defines them as being Ukrainians. Now we have a shift uh, towards uh, understanding Ukrainian culture more uh, as one of the basics for being Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. So uh, majority of people, more than 17 percent, support this approach. So we are speaking now about a mix uh, of civic understanding, basically civic understanding of Ukrainian nation, mm -hmm. but with Ukrainian cultural component of this nation. And so there's another interesting finding in the report that uh, now, two years after Euromaidan, uh, only I think 40 percent of the country mm -hmm. would uh, want Euromaidan again. Whereas I think it was something like 60% of soldiers serving in NATO, maybe more, uh, would support it. 
I mean, why is that the case? And I mean, is it, is it perhaps disappointing or surprising that only 40% of the country, a minority, would want it again? 40% uh, of the country, it's a uh, uh, rather big part. It's a relative majority. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you take the uh, part of anti-Maidan, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that only 7% su would support anti-Maidan in this situation. And uh, uh, of course, a bigger part of population wouldn't like uh, to support anybody because they just wouldn't like another revolution. Sure. So people need some stability. But uh, you see that uh, the uh, preferences of the majority of the population are on the side of Maidan as a set of some uh, ideas, uh, some new goals, some thoughts, some approaches. But it's a complex of, of, of mind, mm -hmm. better than the, just a simple uh, uh, division between one and another. And if you're speaking about uh, atom members, of members of their families, it's a very interesting observation because uh, they demonstrate more active patriotism. And among the soldiers fighting uh, in Ato, I mean, how many of them have Ukrainian as a native language? Does that play a role? I think uh, I saw in the poll there was another 70% maybe. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, this, this part is bigger than, but uh, probably it's linked to, uh, to the fact that uh, they originate basically, so there are more ATO members from western and from central region, mm -hmm. and just, uh, just a national spread. And uh, less part uh, is from southern Ukraine and eastern Ukraine. Uh, because of that, probably we have this uh, shift in uh, the uh, distribution of, of those uh, factors as language, as cultural belongings, uh, belongings. But what is most important uh, for me in this uh, category of people is just a reflection of their patriotism. Sure. And their patriotism, does it, does it depend on language or does it depend on this more civic understanding? I think it depends on civic understanding because it's correlated also with political orientation, with support on Maidan, with geopolitical orientation, with, uh, with orientation on EU, on uh, NATO, sure. just a pro-Western minded people, basically. And what shifts also have you seen in opinions on whether or not Ukraine should join NATO over the past few years? Uh, I think it's a very dramatic shift because now we have 44% uh, according to this poll and uh, absolute majority from the people who are intending to participate in the referendum, mm -hmm. if, it, if it's hold. Uh, but in previous years, uh, I think the highest point was 23 or 22%. So now we have a serious shift and uh, for, for okay. NATO accession. And we have it twice more people, mm -hmm. and I think this figure is going closer to 50%. What we find in this uh, study is that uh, Ukrainian society undergoes serious changes. And uh, we have a process uh, of uh, very rapid formation of this common uh, Ukrainian identity as based on civic values of citizenship, but all together with uh, understanding that Ukrainian culture is the basis a cultural basis for joining the cultures of all peoples who are, live in Ukraine and who are Ukrainian citizens. And uh, this is the way that Ukrainian nation will be developing into uh, pro-European and pro-Western oriented nation as a part of European cultural space. So uh, this study also confirms that this geopolitical orientation, this European orientation, also linked with the factor of uh, being Ukrainian, no knowledge of Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture. Uh, what is also important from our side, that uh, there is a closer difference uh, from, uh, between different regions in Ukraine. We may say that Western and Central Ukraine now are almost the same, mm -hmm. while 10 years before it was uh, rather significant difference. Eastern Ukraine is closer to Central Ukraine than before. And uh, southern Ukraine as well is going to the same direction. Probably there are some differences with Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast with their peculiarities. And, uh, uh, but I think basically <coughs> the, we are speaking uh, with this in the context of, of conflict. And the overall trend is towards the west. Of course. And, uh, yes. yes. Uh, so Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainians are uh, shaping as a European nation and we are going the way probably that uh, some of European nations have passed in 19th century and some of them will pass in 20th century.
Ukrainian hostages Gennady Afanasyev and Yuri Soloshenko were released from Russia and returned to Ukraine on Tuesday in a prisoner swap that saw two pro-Russian journalists, Vitaly Didenko and Yelena Glishinska, sent to Russia in a deal whose uh, uh, conditions will be better explained by Natalia. So um, it was important to understand that Gennady Afanasyev and Yuri Soloshenko, the youngest and the eldest uh, from the group, uh, from the Ukrainians who held there, had the problems with health. Uh, so uh, that was the part why exactly them, not another, uh, rev not another hostages like Alexey Tsov and Alexander Kolchenko had been there. We still don't know what would happen to them. Uh, and uh, what is interesting with this swap that Elena Glishinska and Vitaly Vitaly Didenko are the Ukrainian citizens. So there were Ukrainian citizens swapped for the Ukrainian citizens who were sent to Russia. And um, they both were, let's say, to some extent, in Odessa described not exactly like journalists, but some activists promoting the um, freedom of Bessarabia. It's a territory near Odessa. Uh, but we have the research on, the, um, on, on, on what is the situation there. In that particular case, they wanted to create this kind of a Bessarabian nation, uh, People's, People's, Council, Republic. People's Council, People's Council, uh, which uh, the, uh, and the meeting, the gathering of this uh, council had been in one of the buildings in Odessa, in a very, very small place. Uh, it was a year ago, and later they had been arrested. But they had been pardoned, uh, so um, it's, it's, it's really a big case for the Ukrainian if, if uh, been pardoned, legal system. Why, why send them to Russia? So, no, but the point, indeed, so from the legal point of view, it's still very, very complicated to understand how it worked, uh, but it has given some of the uh, more, uh, the feeling that there are different ways still to swap the prisoners, which go somehow beyond the international law and which go beyond the Ukrainian legal system. But we're following that. Uh, but beside that, we had our journalist, Angelina Karyakina, who talked to Gennady Afanasyev. Uh, he had been from, uh, he's from Crimea, so currently he's an internally displaced person. He had to move to uh, Kiev now. He's still uh, already not in the hospital, so we managed to talk to him and he explained how he spent almost two years in Russia. <laughs>《I welcome all of you. I am really happy that everything ended this way. We were just released, but now we will fight for our guys, for all of them who are now in captivity. We will fight even for the Russian citizens who are in trouble. They genuinely support Ukraine and us, political prisoners. Thank you to them. I again wish to thank Petro Poroshenko and the Ukrainian people. You did a lot. The support that I received, the letters, it worked and cheered me up. Today, when I left the prison, we drove with a motorcade, a lot of cars and just two people, me and Yordi Salashenka. We looked around and saw the plane. At that moment, we realized that this is all for us, for simple citizens, that Ukraine, citizens of Ukraine, society and consciousness, we have all of this. And it worsens a lot. And now we will give everything for our country, our people. We will do everything that we can. How do you feel in general? In my homeland, even better. It was difficult, but we deal with everything. All of this made me stronger. I'll have medical supervision, then I will improve my health and will start working. How did your day look like? Have you been prepared? What did they say when you woke up? I was in custody for a month and a half. The first prison was in Russia. I didn't know when we would have an exchange or would we ask for a pardon. Just today, at 10 a.m., they asked me to pack up. I didn't know where I was going. I packed, and then they brought me to a building where they spoke about releasing me. Now I am going to be released, and I am ready to go home. I am very happy. I am very happy, and to be honest, I am even more thankful. What plans do you have? In few words, what are you planning to do? I want to be with my family at first, and then you will see. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hrvatski pays a special attention to the case of the prisoners uh, because the most famous are already freed, like Nadia Savchenko, and uh, there is less attention to many people who are not in any case public figure. Um, and there are currently up to still 30 people uh, who are detained, including the Crimea. So um, we um, have the Stanislav Klich, the man you can see, uh, he has been sentenced for 22 years imprisonment by the Grozny court in Chechnya, allegedly for fighting on the side of Chechen separatists in the 1994. He hadn't been in Chechnya. That is, uh, there was a lot of testimonies of the other people who could confirm that he at that time had been in Ukraine. Uh, so the charges are widely seen in the West as politically motivated, and uh, our correspondent, Kira uh, Talstikova, had chance to sit down with a Klich mother during her way to Chechnya, and that's what we hear. And I also have to mention that Stanislav Klich has currently, for a while, had problems with the mental health after the imprisonment. <laughs> Ну, от це, що прицькає, як його. 
А то кажуть, ночі мало людей, які хотіли. Тоді не так страшно було, як зараз страшно. У нас по городі ходити. От. А він каже, мама, то для чого? Раді Богу, у мене для цього кулаки є, такі в нього кулаки. От. Каже, у мене для цього кулаки є, а так, то кому я треба? І так от спокійно до цього відносився. Коли він ніяким ні оружієм не влікався, ніколи в світі. А тоді, як учився в університеті, то тоді, от, знаєте ж, Радянський Союз розвалився, не було ні патронів, не було нічого. А то прийдуть на кафедру воєнну, там їм щось там розкажуть. А це і вся була воєнна кафедра, а ніякої навіть муштри не було. Який в його були... Привічка, щоб там, як знаєте, оці ж у науці, так вони десь там тренувалися, десь я то він цього не робив. То всі побачили, як повернулася Надія Савченко. Напевно, і у вас те саме було відчуття, коли ви побачили, що ну а ну а раб. Ви знаєте, от і не було таких не було? відчуттів. Не було чому, тому що за Надією дуже багато людей стояло. Дуже багато таких впливових людей. От. І тут, мабуть, все-таки яка то більш політична гра і над усіми ними, я так думаю. От. Ну так, Надія, кажуть, умирає останньою, і я надіюся, мені так хочеться, бо він, коли не заходив, яке б він не заходив в судове засідання, і де б він не був, хто б не приходив до його, він кричить одне, кричить одне слово, я ніколи тут не був. Все. все що зараз він може говорити. А там, що вірші читав, от ето мені розказують, що на ці на вироку там він і вірші, які то Висоцького читав, які то пісні співав, чисті пруди. Він писав мені оце останній вірш, він мені писав з матір'ю, так писав, що як він в садик ходив, от як він йшов із садика, падав, як у нього ці та сама витримала сльози. Ну, таке, тяжеле. Yes, yet we should know that the rug, some of the people who had been released and they are taking care and they're worried about what would happen to those to, who are still in prison. Uh, we have come up with a... Uh, I would say it's not a project, it's rather the uh, media, the interview, a program. So uh, what we've done, we invited um, two pretty famous prisoners who had been uh, released recently from Ukraine and from Russia. Nadia Savchenko is a Ukrainian officer, currently a member of parliament. Pyotr Pavlensky is a Russian um, actionist, the uh, artist. Uh, so, um, in order to sit together and to discuss, you know, their experience, what they can do to the uh, other people who are still in prison, discuss what's happening with the war, how is it to be free uh, while, while you are in prison. So, uh, that's something we've done this weekend and uh, please follow next week. We will have this discussion uh, for you uh, prepared during the next week, which could be unthinkable a couple of years ago that you would have a Ukrainian officer talking to the, you know, like some uh, avant-garde Russian artist. But that's our reality today. And finally, we would like to offer you a glimpse of some aspects of life in a southern western Russian city of Rostov, situated quite close to the Ukrainian border. Recently, a pro-democracy protest happened in this million-strong city of Russia, and the journalists of Romatske were able to film it. Вот есть такой закон, вот Пожалуйста, назовите себя, пожалуйста. Не буду я себя называть, я уже наз... я да называлась до того, что меня штрафовали по вот этому вот делам, которые я не нарушала, но заплатила три своей пенсии, 20 тысяч. Поздравляю нашу доблестную полицию. Год назад меня не вот на этом вас и поймали. Все, хватит, все. Значит, теперь я с полицией работаю. Ой, вот с этим плакатом я стою. Здесь есть все ссылки. С вами ничего. С троллями, с вами ничего. С троллями не разговариваем. Значит, все фотографии. Изначально мы планировали заявить акцию около памятника Ленина на Большой Садовой, но, к сожалению, нам отказали. Вот. Площадка перед Государственной публичной библиотекой является специально отведенным местом, где можно проводить публичные мероприятия без предварительного уведомления численности 100 человек. Собственно говоря, суть 
Суть акции отражена в этом плакате. Россия без диктатуры. Мы считаем, что Россия все более и более становится диктаторским государством. Власть захвачена одним человеком. Практически страна управляется в ручном режиме человеком одним. И мы все знаем этого человека, это Владимир Владимирович Путин. Мы против этой ситуации. Мы за сменяемость власти, за честные выборы. Те выборы, которые будут в сентябре, сильно вызывают большие сомнения. Почему мы вышли сегодня выразить свою позицию? Нас не так много, с учетом того, что акция не согласована. Это, наверное, самые смелые люди Ростова. Собирать, ребят! А можно? А почему? Рота. А, а скажите, пожалуйста, а почему? Вы нарушили статью. Вам сейчас мы доведем все в отделе. А кто остается? Никто не остается, все забираем. А вот, вот, вот Ну это сейчас будем проверять их тоже, раз же нет или нет. Что вы им стояли? Я вообще не стояла в пяти. Я вообще не стояла в пяти. Я с вами разговариваю. Я сейчас стала в одиночный кабинет. Собираюсь отойти на 50 метров. Вот туда. Нет. Как не ведет? Ну, пока это не ведет. Что вам так бабушка одна понятна? На самом деле мы здесь действуем в рамках закона. Она нарушает закон. А расскажите, пожалуйста, вы представитель национально освободительного движения. Да, а с какой целью вы пришли сюда? Ну, мы устраиваем пикет. Вчера и сегодня у нас праздник День России. Мы стоим в поддержку президента его национально ориентированного курса. Угу. Отмечаем праздник. У нас официально зарегистрировано мероприятие сегодня и вчера. Вот официальные бумаги. Но нам сейчас устраивают провокации, мешают. Мы просим правоохранительные органы разобраться с этим делом. Вот, где женщина... Так, еще раз. Он... Я бы не еще на водке. Можете не трогать. Что? Давайте. Там он еще не пролезет. Давайте, просадите, просадите, присаживайте. Мальчики привычно садятся в автомобиль Все. отечественного производителя. Рука не дрожит. So this is what happens in Rostov, in Russia, at least some of these days. And today, tonight, on Sunday, from Kiev, goodbye from me, Andrei Kulikov. And I say goodbye and encourage to stay tuned and follow us on social networks because we are working for you 24-7. Не вір мені, бо я брехать не вмію. Не жди мене, бо я і так прийду. Я принесу тобі свою надію, а подарую смуток і біду. Слова ясні лише мені відомі, у бурмотіння скучне перелю. Свою усмішку холодній втомі бездумно. Без голову утоплю и буду...